All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the War and Astronomical Society. We are live at Cranbrook and hi on YouTube. Um, uh, David actually uh, uh, requested that uh, he go first because he's way out in, in, in Arizona. So I'm going to let you go first. David, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, I need to go first, but I'm not. I'm on, not at home, and I'm not getting any picture. But I can obviously can be heard. So I want to welcome you all to the meeting. And for my quotation today, I'd like to quote from Shakespeare. And this is where um, Shakespeare is writing the end of Macbeth, and he says, oh, "I used to be a good writer. I used to know how to write a sentence." And but uh, I'm at the place where Lady Macbeth has just died, and I need to write something special. I have no idea what to write. And he writes things, and he throws them out, and he writes some more. And finally, there's a tap on his shoulder, I like to think. And he turns around, and there is God standing behind him. And God says, Will, take a break, get some coffee, have a beer. I got this. And this is what he writes, in which, he, in my opinion, Shakespeare anticipates general relativity by 400 years. And it goes like this. He's just been told that Lady Macbeth has passed on, and he says, she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in its petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time, and then is heard no more. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour across the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, signifying everything. And that's the line. I thought you'd enjoy that. Thank you, and have a wonderful meeting tonight. Thank you, David. All right. So again, this is the Warren Astronomical Society. I'm your president, Bob Tremblay. We are live on YouTube and in person at Cranbrook. So do we have any first timers tonight? And we have one. Hi. How'd you find out about us? You said I thought we heard you you were at Astronomy at the Beach, right? Awesome. We we would like more people to do that from Astronomy at the Beach. Awesome. Well, you did good. Tell all your friends. All right. Um, so uh, you can uh, you can join or you guys can renew your membership and uh, with our uh, with our treasurer tonight, who does not have a pay box yet. So um, typically, what we do as a tradition, we like to go uh, back and forth through the rows and have say who they are. And uh, so I'm Bob Trump. Okay. all right. All right. So, uh, let me watch calendars off. Are we all gone? We do. So, we do have a couple calendars left. Uh, Mark Kezier, do we have wearables? You can buy wearables tonight from Mark Kezier over there. Um, you can see I can see what is available in our store. And I am just thrilled Mark is doing that. Is, I you said your your cousin or nephew? My daughter your daughter in law is is so that is really awesome. Um so officers reports. We have a full board. Thank you. Uh we we uh, uh we, we actually got our secretary at the bank, which was pretty cool. Um one of the things that um that came out of the the banquet is that this guy here spends a lot of time checking people in and doing raffle tickets. And so I emailed Bob Berta about this. We'd like to get some volunteers to um to handle the check-in and do the raffle. 
be it Boy Scouts, your kids or grandkids or whatever. We got enough time to think about it. But but if you have any suggestions, a couple people that uh, would be able to do the handle the check-in and get a nice meal out of it, uh, let us know. So uh, that is it for mine, Dale. First VP, Dale Parker. Wow, hello everyone. Um, as always, I'm looking for speakers. Uh, if you've got even a, a gem of an idea for what you'd like to, to speak on, uh, talk to me. Let's see what we can come up with, okay? Uh, we need speakers. All right, our uh, second VP, is Riyad Mahdi, is not here. He sent me a, a report. He said we had several good observing uh, of Jeff McLeod, and we thank him for his great efforts. Jeff is still leading activities to renovate the walkway around the observatory. Our first open house is this year on Saturday, January 27th. We need volunteers for a spring cleanup on April 27th. Open house. open house for the Perseids, August 10th. Uh, and the picnic is being planned for August 24th. Other events will be announced later. I'm sure the Metro, Metro Parks are going to get back with us and they're going to want some people. Um, so that was it. He will he will take your money tonight without without a uh, uh, a, a, a black so oh. muted here one minute. So, uh, Charlie, anything, anything to say other than uh, you just started, you probably right now. Charles, okay, Charles, there. All right, um, outreach, Jeff McLeod. I no longer have to promise clear skies, but on behalf of Riyadh, he told me clear skies for the next open house. Uh, I don't know how he's going to do it. I didn't have much luck, but uh, he's more in tune with the observatory than I am. Uh, outreach, I got nothing right now, but uh, I'm hoping to get a handle on outreach. So... I want to put an email pool together. I I know some people for sure, uh, but if you're interested in like getting the outreach emails and participating, please get at me so I can like get you on a list so I know who you are. So when things come, also if anyone and I mean almost anyone, Mr. Franchise, you're not going to Tom Brady again. No, so I just want to make sure we're not like, oh, we're going to get a quarterback that's going to take us to nine Super Bowls in twenty years. Uh oh, that's not me. Uh, that's the other Jeff. Uh, if you're going to be here for the eclipse and miss the eclipse, which you should not do, but if you are doing that, um, there's a lot of libraries and people that are going to be asking for things on the day of the eclipse. Solar telescopes, they want to see a partial eclipse instead of doing the right thing and telling people to get away skin. Okay. Uh, that's my. Uh, what science uh, communication for the day? Uh, so that's all I got. Nothing, nothing on the books just yet, but definitely things to come. All right, thank you. All right, that was Jeff McLeod. Uh, let's see, uh, publications that would be Vichalia. Yeah, Vasp is online, and the annual mailing list will be going out this week. All righty. She is the really short one, like that. Okay, uh, our newsletter is up. All right, uh, let's do some astronomy in the news. Uh, I was watching a video uh, by um, Fraser Kane, and he and uh, he he mentioned that the European Southern Observatory has just released an image of the running chicken nebula. The image is a three point nine gigabyte download. Get this. It's 42,000 by 37,000 pixels. It's You could cover the side of a building with that, and I think we should. 
Just and I'm, I'm actually serious. I would like to see that image downtown Detroit somewhere with a WAS logo on it. So um, Stellarium, if you use Stellarium, version 23.4 was released on Christmas Eve. Has a lot of telescope control updates and a new sky culture called the Tibetan Lunar Mansions, which I've never heard of. I had to look it up. The lunar mansions are 28 asterisms found in 28 segments of the sky. They're called lunar mansions because the moon passes through these asterisms in order as if they were mansions for the moon to stay in during the cycle of 27 or 28 days. So there you go. But um, the Stellarium has been, uh, they've won awards for all the sky cultures and, that they've been adding recently. Um, special interest groups, David Levy, he is here and gone. Do we do have a message from Charles? Oh, I have my glasses on, yikes. <laughs> okay, Charles. Charles. Okay, this is uh, a message from uh, our, our new secretary. He says his background is in architecture and design, but more recently he's founded a festival in 2002 named after the Ann Arbor Monroe Street Fair. Yeah. So I'm into special events and sponsorship shells. They love bringing people together, science and studying math without numbers and measuring intangibles. Hey, you need to give some presentations on that. Uh, he's here to observe, discover, and learn more about unexplored and unknown and see beyond the horizon. Well, we're all about that. So um, let's see. Uh, any uh, SDO in um, solar, uh, Marty? Solar. Yeah, uh, in my uh, in my uh, uh, report in the WAC uh, last right, the uh, sun blew an X five flare uh, earlier uh, a couple weeks ago, which is huge. Yeah, that was the good news. Now, not much of anything. There's a lot of very small spots on the sun. One region is kind of active uh, uh, magnetically, so it might flare up to a little bit. There's a small coronal hole. Uh, it's kind of insignificant, so um, just wait for the good clear skies. Stop buying telescopes. <laughs> yeah, whenever I went to science fiction conventions and brought my telescope, everybody said, well, it's going to be cloudy now. Thanks, Bob. So it's my fault. Ow. So... Yeah, I, I, from, from what I heard, like the next day there were auroras, like pretty far south. So um, if anyone has any wants to start a special interest group, great, go ahead and do that. You know, they suggest you know, like radio, tele, radio telescopes, uh, computers and technology, education, which I'm all about, light pollution, podcasting, whatever. If you want to start a special interest group related to astronomy. Go ahead and do it. Talk to the board, and, and let's get you in the in the newsletter. So, has anybody had any observing reports or astral photos? Anybody online have any photos they can share? Was it cloudy the last three weeks, four weeks? Oh, observing. <laughs> what do you got, Bob? Can you come up here. Yeah, let, let the audience hear it. For our club newsletter, um, I put a uh, photograph I did recently in there. So check it out. I thought it was interesting because uh, in that photograph, there's a star. Uh, and that star is, uh, the surface tem temperature of it is 45,000 degrees. Our sun is 5,500 degree Kelvin. And even more interesting is the, the luminance of that is 100,000 times as bright as our sun. So that is so bright. I mean... You get to close your eyes and you still see it. And, it's, and they say that it's a very young star forming region. But any stars that are formed, though, they won't last very long. Do not be too close. No, to don't get too close to that, natural. But anyway, and also, this is not so much as a photograph that's existing, but in the newsletter, I also put a link and some information about a uh, observatory you can build if you're into. Uh, 3D printing or using Raspberry Pi for stuff, you can build a pilomar, 
what you use in your Raspberry Pi, and it's pretty slick. So check out the newsletter. I'm putting a plug in because I, may, I want to make certain people look at our newsletter. It's some really cool stuff in there. Hey, man. No, so uh, I actually, I, I just remembered this. Um, the, in the last couple of weeks, working uh, with some stuff with the Vatican Observatory Foundation, um, uh, I found out one of our members is a member of the Association of Historic Observatories. And there's, yeah, I, I would actually like to have one of those guys come and talk to us about that. So I just found out they existed. So, yep, Facebook group, and yeah, well, it's one of yep. So I, I think that would be a very interesting talk. So if we don't have any... Uh, any, any astro photos to share or anything like that, we can go ahead and do our short talk. Dale. Angelo. Get out your face. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce somebody that many of us know from years back. Angelo Di Donato is a graduate of Wayne State University and a retired engineer from the Defense and Automotive Industries. As a lifelong amateur astronomer and 10-year member of this organization, his particular interest in astronomy lie in the origin and evolution of the universe. He only thinks about small things. He also enjoys being part of our outreach program. This topic tonight, the cosmic distance ladder using Cepheid variables. Angelo. Thank you, Dale. All right, so uh, what, um, what I'm going to do tonight is talk a little bit about Cepheid variables and uh, uh, how they came to become uh, uh, st uh, standard candles for cosmic distances and where they fit in a cosmic distance ladder. Now, let me see here. Just hit these. Uh, there we go. Okay, okay. Okay. Now, for those of you that may not be uh, all that familiar with, can you get rid of all that? There's nothing. Okay. So, cosmic distance ladder. What is it? Uh, you you can get you can get. Uh, different views of this, but I kind of sketched out a very basic one to give you an idea. I sketched out a very basic one to give you an idea, yes. Um, beginning with local uh, cosmic distances, sun, moon, asteroids, planets, geometry can get you the distance to the sun or the moon. We bounced off radar off asteroids and the planet Venus. So, you know, that's kind of a local, very local neighbor. Uh, the next rung of the ladder is trigonometric parallax. And I think you all know what that is. But uh, and we could talk about that later. That's limited. That's limited to Milky Way stars uh, up to about, I don't know, maybe a, uh, 100 light years or so, maybe more. With, with these satellites, it's getting further and further. They're making a lot of progress. <laughs> now, this is where the Cepheid variables come in, spectroscopic parallax, where we study the, the they have to be bright enough if you know in these star clusters and nearby galaxies, we could determine their distances for a pretty high accuracy. And the reason is because these uh, spectroscopic variables are extremely bright, giant stars. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and we'll get into that. That's that's where the that's where they come in. Now you can get to a, a, a far enough away, extremely distant gal uh, galaxies uh, in the universe, uh, billions of light years away. 
And there we have to, of course, resort to uh, supernovas, uh, galaxy, the Hubble's law, uh, uh, using the redshift. That's what gives us that those distances. All right. So let's continue. Let's, and it all starts with this uh, amazing lady astronomer, Henrietta Swan Leavitt, a graduate of uh, Red. She graduated and uh, went to work for Edward Pickering at the Harvard Observatory. She, along with a number of other women, were assigned to look at plates from the telescope, look at those star fields. And in her case, she was asked to look at uh, variables in the large and small Mag Magellanic clouds. And that's what she did. Extremely boring, uh, but she did. Thousands of plates. Um, and what, the, what she did was she discovered an unusual set of variables, which now we know is separate, that have the direct relationship between their brightness and their uh, their uh, their periods, pulsation periods and brightness. Okay, so that's uh, Henrietta Swan, uh, Swan Levitt. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Now, this particular diagram uh, shows us the uh, brightness uh, uh, of uh, uh, delta sapphire, and what, as you can see, the the uh, brightness of this star rises to about three and a half, or five point four rather, excuse me, and then it dims down to about four point three, and then it rises back up to to uh, three point six again, and it's repeatable. So this uh, delta sapphire has a period of about 5.4 days, and that's, that's how it is. Um, and what Henrietta uh, Levitt found was that for, Seth, for variables that have a longer period, longer periods, these are much brighter stars. There's a correlation. Uh, for Cephids that uh, have a much shorter period, okay, like that, the distance between them is shorter, and these are dimmer stars. Okay, so there's a there's a correlation, pulsation period illumination of correlation. All right, now what did she do? Uh, her discovery led to Levitt's law: brighter cephids have longer pulsation periods. In 1912, she put out this is her actual chart that she produced of about 25 cephid variables, and she plotted. The, uh, the luminosity of the, the highest luminosity and the and the, the dimmest uh, as they go through their cycle, like we just said. And this this chart clearly shows a correlation, a very beautiful correlation in these particular stars. Okay, so um, it wasn't long after this that a Danish uh, astronomer, which we've all heard of, Enyar Hertzberg, uh, picked up on it. And he said, wow, I can use this. I can use this new information, this correlation between brightness and uh, and uh, uh, period to determine the distance of these, these stars. And if I can do that, I can, I've got a, a way of measuring. Up until now, see, Enyar Levitt didn't know the distance of these stars. But what she did know was that these stars were in the Magellanic clouds and they were about the same distance. It wasn't like the dim ones were far and the bright ones were close. So it took the distance factor out of it. She did know they were about the same distance, but she didn't know how much. Well, so Hertzberg, he uh, went ahead using spectroscopic uh, parallax, was able to get the, uh, the, the spectrum of these stars and with the period, he was able to determine the magnitude and uh, calculate the distance. And I'll show you how we did that. Harlow Shapley quickly realized that too. And he uh, located the center of the Milky Way, estimated the, the distance to the center of the Milky Way, and our location in the galaxy. Now, this was at a time when the astronomers thought that our galaxy was the universe. You know, and, and all these fuzzies that they were looking at they were all in our galaxies. That's what they believed. Well, Harlow Shapley, uh, Shapley uh, showed that that wasn't the case. Now, he estimated the distance to the 
star clusters. And he noticed that they were all gathered in a halo around one particular part of the sky and therefore determined that, uh, yeah, our galaxy is flat and we are located about 30,000 light years away. So that was uh, quite an accomplishment. And then Edwin Hubble, uh, you've all heard of him. Uh, he uh, uh, found a particular Cepheid in the Andromeda galaxy. And uh, using that uh, Cepheid, he was able to determine the distance to the galaxy, uh, the Andromeda galaxy. And then, then he went on using Cepheids again to develop his Hubble constant, which is constantly being updated. But nevertheless, uh, all these distances that these guys came up with were not exactly right. They were off of quite a bit. But the process was directionally correct, because back in those days of that technology, the error bars were pretty wide. Uh, but uh, anyway, they did it and uh, uh, came up with some pretty remarkable results as, as a result of uh, uh, Levitt's discovery. Okay, so this is uh, just a, uh, on Hertzberg again. This is his first star chart uh, diagram. He, uh, him, and, and uh, 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 Russell. Uh, uh, took, took measurements of thousands and thousands of stars. And he noticed that they all lined up in, uh, in you know, in a narrow band. Uh, and uh, so that's how that's how this particular thing evolved. And, and he was able to place the Cepheids in there, too. Uh, so now, uh, and then moving forward to modern times, this is what the uh, uh, hertzsprung Russell diagram looks like. Uh, you get the main sequence. You got the absolute magnitude. Now, this is a magnitude of the stars. Uh, just to review, at uh, at uh, ten par uh, ten parsecs, thirty two light years. As if if all the stars were located thirty two light years away, this is the luminosity of these stars. It's a place where the apparent luminosity and absolute luminosity are the same. Okay, this is the luminosity compared to the sun. Uh, these are the spectral classes. Uh, Annie Jump Cannon came up with those, and, we, and they included them down here. And Russell was the one that installed and put in the uh, temperatures. Okay, so this is a very valuable. This is like the Rosetta Stone of astronomy. Okay, now, how does that play into the Cepheids? Here we have. There's two types of Cepheids that we now know, but they didn't know at the time which contributed to a lot of errors. Uh, type 1 Cepheids right here are, are the brightest. They're the more massive and luminous ones. Uh, they have higher metallosity, which means that they have more elements higher than uh, hydrogen. Um, type 2 Cepheids are, you know, in this chart, but they're not quite as bright as you can see. And they are low, uh, low metallosity compared to the type uh, 1 Cepheids. Now, one thing you can tell about this chart, even the dimmest of the Cepheids are thousands of times uh, uh, brighter than the sun. Uh, the brightest Cepheids, tens of thousands of times brighter than the sun. And because they're so bright, they make a perfect, perfect uh, standard candle. The, the brighter the Cepheids are, that you can locate the further out, you can determine distances into the universe. So that's the correlation. This is a correlation uh, between the period of the Cepheids and the luminosity of the Cepheids. Luminosity compared to the sun. The sun's luminosity times that is what these things are. That's how bright they are. Okay, let's move on. Here's another chart uh, showing the results of, comparing the results of uh, their periods versus the absolute magnitude. The other one was in luminosity. Okay, type one and uh, type two seconds out to here. This is how they stack up. Okay. Now, we have all this information. How do we use it to determine distance? Okay. Well, the first thing, one, the first, I'm just, I'm just going to highlight a couple of methods. Uh, the first method is to uh, this inverse square uh, method, where the flux of the light coming into your telescope in watts, in watts per square meter, is equal to the 
luminosity divided by four pi d squared. Okay, so luminosity is going to be the uh, luminosity versus period that we just showed. Uh, say if you have a a, a stepped with a, a period of three days, come across and it's a thousand times lighter, or brighter than the sun. Okay, that should that that's your number here for luminosity. For the flux in watts is the light coming into your telescope from the star. Okay, and uh, 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 that's that's that, that's what you would uh, that's how you determine the luminosity of the uh, in the in the formula here. And once you have these two numbers, you can solve for d. So you can see the mathematics is pretty straightforward, not not very complicated at all. Mm -hmm. Well, you know the surface of the area of a of a sphere. Well, it's four pi r squared, right? But light goes out in all directions, and it's dims by a factor of by by a square. By, by okay, that's where the pi r squared comes from. You know, if this is one unit at this distance, if I go twice as far, that same unit is spread out over four because pi r squared two squared, but that amount of energy is now reflected in one fourth of all those squares. It's, you know, the, the, it, it's inversely proportional to distance. Anyway, you put the flux of the, the starlight coming in, illumination compared to the sun, and you get D. It's beautiful. Next, there's another way, if you want to work with magnitude, uh, we have the distance modulus. Uh, this is a, uh, and you know, again, here we have our chart uh, the period in days versus absolute magnitude. Again, the magnitude of a star at 10 parsecs away. Um, classical Cepheids versus the uh, second, uh, number one. Uh, so here we come along here, we, 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 dis we determine the period of the star. We find it along here, we come up, and we get what the absolute magnitude is. Once you have these numbers, you use these, you use this equation, d over 10 squared, and you solve for d. Again, pretty straightforward, simple math. Not very complicated, okay? That's how we take the uh, uh, the Cepheids and use them as distance candles. It's because, they're repeatable. Uh, the amplitudes is the same, um, uh, and uh, they're very reliable. In fact, this is the most reliable way, right, even today, to uh, come up with the uh, um, uh, uh, the expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble constant. And actually, the, the Webb telescope has messed that up a little bit. Because now that thing is able to see even further, and there's a little bit of a variance there, so they're working on that. But uh, this remains one of the best ways uh, of uh, determining the uh, expansion rate of the universe. All right. Very good. Now, I well, only we got 15 minutes, so. <laughs> um, okay, all of these accomplishments that we talked about, none of it would have happened, at least not to these guys at that time, if it hadn't been for this lady right here. Um, she, it was a benchmark uh, moment in astronomy. She really, you know, that discovery revolutionized astronomy. So that was very, uh, now, uh, it give, now, uh, 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 they did mention, they did say that uh, uh, they recommended her for a Nobel Peace Prize at the time. They recognized uh, how, uh, how uh, important that was. Edwin Hubble recommended her for a Peace Prize. Uh, and the reason is, you know, she never, she never even looked through a telescope. Those are the days when women couldn't even get near a telescope. Everything they did was off of photographic plates. And uh, so that just goes to show you what a remarkable achievement it was. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Well, that's basically it, guys. Uh, do you have any questions? Otherwise, that'll wrap it up. Very nice. And who's going to be the next speaker? Who's going to take on the next one? 15 minutes. No, I'm talking about who's the next 15 minute speaker. <laughs> I'm picking up on what Dale said. Thank you.
Maximum. Two and a half higher, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to pull this up. Really? Never. Right, well, um, while he's. You, you need to do a presentation about that. So while Angelo, while Angelo was up there, if you don't know what a CFID variable is, it's a variable star. The first one was discovered in the constellation Cepheus. And I was wondering, why are they variable? Well, there's a huge explanation here, but they think it has something to do with helium heating up and then uh, becoming fluorescent, like, like a fluorescent tube strikes. So, and there's a question. Pardon me? Polaris? Oh, I didn't know that. It's all, Pol Polaris is actually a binary, too. Yeah. We have a question on the internet. We have a hand. All right. Um, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, yes, so sorry. Uh, so just one quick question to Angelo. Uh, he showed a, a picture with many stars, you know, in, in, in the 2D plot with temperatures and luminosity, and there was the sun and the Bernard star and so on. I, I couldn't get the like the, the idea of that of that graph, like what it actually what what actually it represents. I mean, he said that that's sort of a, a very one of the well known uh, diagrams for astronomers. So yeah, if if you could just share, uh, just explain that a little bit. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Exactly. This is the one. Yeah, the, the, the slide number eight. Uh, uh, yeah, slide eight. Uh, uh, one before this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> You to, okay, you explain, explanation of that. Right. Okay, well, this diagram was developed by Hertz from Russell. Uh, these were, uh, Russell was an American uh, astronomer. Uh, Hertzsprung was Danish. And Hertzsprung was the one that started, uh, he wanted to plot, he wanted to plot magnitude, uh, uh, excuse yeah, magnitude versus color. His first attempt was, he looked at the stars, he determined the color of each star, and he wanted to produce a chart of uh, comparing magnitude versus uh, color. And that's what he did. And what he found was that the majority of these stars fell along this main, what's now known as the main sequence, okay? Uh, so that's what this represents. Now this chart, and then of course, the, the, the hottest stars, the brightest stars were on uh, the blue and white over here. The, the coolest were red, okay? And what this chart does, now this is a modern chart. It shows the luminosity, uh, the absolute magnitude that we talked about, the period. Um, I guess it's not in here, but that's you'd have to go to the other one for that. And then, of course, over the top is the, is the temperature of the sun. So you can come along. Here's the sun as an example, our sun, okay? It's spectral. It's got a, it, it, the luminosity is one. That's one unit. And then uh, if you go up, that's this, this is multiples of the sun. And Cepheid variables are right here. As you can see, Cepheid variables are thousands of times brighter than the sun. And because they vary, that's why we can use them as distance, can, uh, distance candles. Okay. Uh, so you have luminosity. You have, uh, you have uh, 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 absolute magnitude, which is... The, the, the brightness of stars at exactly 10 parsecs away, which is like 32 uh, light years. Is that right? Yeah, 32 light years. Um, so that's the significance of this. You can see the evolution of the stars. This is a transition point right here from a star transitioning over to a supergiant star. 
Okay. And uh, I don't know, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, no, th thanks, thanks, no, that, that was that was really good. So, so on the on the y-axis, I see one, ten, ten to the power two, ten to the power three. That's all good. Uh, on just uh, yeah, the only thing which I just wanted to confirm with you is if you just go below it, it's that's ten to the power of minus one, right? Because from here, it, it uh, for me, it also seems to be ten to the power of one. So that was the confusion. So basically, what you're saying is that the more you go towards higher, the, it, the those stars are much more. They have much more higher luminosity as compared to the sun, right? So that that, that was more, the yeah. Mm -hmm. More more luminosity going up. You see going that? Up. Yeah, yeah. Now don't don't get that confused with the numbers. The numbers go down, but the, which means that they're brighter. The stars are getting brighter. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, which is kind of odd, but that's how uh, Parkus did it back in the days, uh, back three thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. Um. And then, of course, you got the luminosity compared to the sun. These are multiples of the sun in brightness. Okay. Uh, what else? Can you think of anything else? Dale, can you think of anything else? Okay. I don't know. I guess, unless you have any other questions, I think that just about covers it. Thanks. Thanks, Angelo. Yep. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you for your question. Yeah, if you, if you search for Google on any time, you'll find just some of the um, interesting versions of that. There's one that uh, has a graphical distribution of uh, of star types, and down at the very bottom, it has a whole bunch of red dwarfs, and then they get fewer and fewer as they go up that curve up to the really, really bright ones. All right, so we are going to take a snack break. Uh, let's reconvene in 20 minutes, which is what, going to be a little bit, a uh, couple minutes after eight, so uh, five minutes after eight. So 20 minute snack break. Pardon me? Oh, there's a message. Yeah, you about a book on the as an so there is a uh, message on here in the book, A Brief Welcome to the Universe, in Chapter 3 is a great explanation of the Hertz von Russell Act, described in a very beginner-friendly way, definitely recommended to whoever needs an introduction to the topic. There you go. Very good. All right, so I'm going to put this thing on. Pardon me? Yeah, 805, I'm going to put this on mute now. What? What computer are we in?
too. Yeah. Okay, running a little late here, so a two minute warning. Uh, do the bio break and uh, get your drink and get ready for the feature presentation. This was a very, very famous day yesterday in astronomy. It was my sister's birthday also, but that just uh, used to always throw it at her all the time. In 1610, actually in 1608, uh, there was a fellow named Hans Lippershey who invented the telescope, or at least he's given credit for it. And Hans Lippershey, uh, uh, Galileo got wind of it, and uh, he said, I got to have one of those. So he got a hold of Hans Lippershey, and Lippershey sent him a telescope, which was about a three-inch telescope, uh, excuse me, a three-power telescope. And um, Galileo started looking through, he looked at the, at the moon, you know, and uh, he said, I need a little more power. So what he did is he built himself a 10-power telescope, and he got a little better picture of that, but he says, I want to look at the planets. So what he does is he builds himself a 30-power telescope. And he puts it on Jupiter on January the 7th. And what does he see? He sees Ganymede, excuse me, not Ganymede, he sees Callisto, Io, Io, and Europa. Uh, Ganymede was apparently behind the planet at the time. And then on the 13th, he saw Ganymede. And uh, so that's, those are the Galilean moons. And that happened in 1610, all those years ago. The other thing about it is it was also the start of his problems with the church uh, because the earth was the center of the universe and you can't have something going around Jupiter. It's supposed to be going around us. And uh, the church says, you, you got to keep it real quiet because we, we don't do that. And there were several priests that said, I won't look through your telescope. I don't want to see it. But what happened was they said, you can write a book theorizing about it, but not implicating that it is a fact. And then he got a little bit too aggressive in one of his books, and uh, he went before the Inquisition and was put in a house arrest from 1630 to his death in 1642. So there's a little story about today's date. 1992. Speaking of Galileo, the, uh, there's a couple of podcasts on the Vatican Observatory uh, website about them. We have a, a, a scholar there. He's talking about how Galileo in many current school texts is taught completely wrong. And uh, it's, it's a couple of very interesting podcasts. So anyway, so uh, our feature presentation. I want to say happy perihelion, everybody. Happy perihelion, everybody. Yeah, it was perihelion day, what, a couple days ago? Yeah, I would hear. So uh, tonight's two speakers are going to share the main presentation. Ken Burton, who just spoke, was past president of the WAS and was awarded a lifetime membership. He's traveled to 12 solar eclipses and has also frequently given astronomy presentations to this society and other organizations. Dr. Dale Parton has been an officer of the WAS many times and is currently the first vice president in charge of speakers. He frequently gives presentations to the WAS and also teaches astronomy at Macomb Community College. Tonight, they're going to summarize some of the major astronomical discoveries made in 2023, and there's a lot of them. Take it away, you guys.
Sure. Just that one, that one. Okay, good. Sounds good. Okay, there were very uh, quite a few interesting stories this uh, this last year in astronomy, and some of them are uh, a little bit annoying to listen to, but uh, you'll get over it. <laughs> but uh, let's get started. This is the astronomy room for what is that? Oh, I see. Gosh, you're good at this. That's great. Okay. So let's go ahead and we've got an astronomy review. Let's talk about the first story, which is not coming up. You want me to point, do this? Just click on this. Okay, that's what I'll do. And what is this thing going up here, which I can't read that. Yeah. Get that out of the way. Oh, good. On Sunday, September the 24th, 2023, it's gone. There we go. Is that it? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Back one. We'll have you out of here by Wednesday. up there yeah. Yeah. yeah and in conclusion <laughs> <laughs> Starting to go up. There it goes. It's ready, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is this is the you know, this is how we go down. Yes. Just go on the ground. This way. Okay. Oh, I see. That's easy. Okay, good. Two fingers. Two fingers. Two fingers. Okay. All right. Here we go. On Sunday, September twenty fourth, twenty twenty three, the Osiris Rex, called Origins. Spectral interpretation, resource identification, security, regolith explorer, uh, spacecraft tapped its seven year mission with the successful deposit of a pristine sample of the surface material from the asteroid Bennu in the Utah desert. Now in a specially built clean room at NASA's uh, space, Johnson Space Center in Houston. The sample is being carefully curated before it is shared with researchers around the world and saved for study by future generations. With the sample, which is billions of years old, scientists will explore the origin of this our solar system. It had been an incredibly long journal for, journey for the Monsterous Rex capsule by the time it landed in the Utah desert. The asteroid probe launched in 2016 on a two-year journey to carbon-rich asteroid Bennu with an ambitious mission objective to bring back a hefty sample. Osirix, uh, Osiris Rex did its job well, scooping up 250 grams of extraterrestrial rock and thus before get, uh, uh, jetting off to home. The largest asteroid sample ever returned to the Earth. The Osiris Rex sample is the biggest carbon-rich asteroid sample ever delivered to Earth and will help the scientists investigate the origins of life on our own planet with generations to, for generations to come. 
NASA Chief Bill Nelson said in October when the capsule was open that its contents were, contents were revealed. After dropping off its bad Benno sample, the Osiris Rex spacecraft altered course and earned a new name, Osiris Apex. The old GOG is, is now en route to the asteroid Prophus, which it will study for uh, 18 months, uh, in which time Osiris Rex will return. We good? Okay. So, what did I do? I got it. Okay, we're good to go. Okay. Uh, the Ice Cube and Neutrino Observatory discovered a high energy neutrinos from the Milky Way. Um, that's HL Tauri, uh, aids for the search of planets and perhaps life. We're all seeing uh, photos of our Milky Way galaxy as a beautiful uh, band. Uh, gosh, did I do something wrong here? One second. Okay, let you do it. I, I did so well. Okay, that's where we want to be. Okay. Uh, the in, in addition to views of the Milky Way in visible light, astronomers have uh, shown us our home galaxy and other wavelengths of the spectrum, from radio waves to gamma rays. On June 29, 2023, a team of researchers using the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory in Antarctica released a new image of the Milky Way, a view never seen until now. It's the first image of our galaxy in something other than electromagnetic radiation. Why is it not doing that? I see. When it, I got to get over here when that does that, right? I'm sorry. Let's go back. I got to go back one. That's what I got. Okay. What's that? You got a deal. I use a Mac. I'm not that bad. But I'm trying to go over and it keeps doing what we don't want it to do. Okay, I didn't want to, do, I just wanted to move it over. You're going the wrong way. And there we go. That's what I wanted. Okay, we're getting there. Um, okay, let's go back here. Where, what was the last thing I said? Neutrinos. Okay, this image captures the galaxy with neutrinos or ghost particles. Milky uh, uh, of the Milky Way, which is, was produced by an international team of scientists, including researchers from the University of Canterbury, using a huge Antarctic telescope. The Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory in Antarctica has produced an image of the Milky Way using neutrinos. High energy astrophysics is the study of the process that occur within stars, black holes, and supernova. These processes can be uh, monitored by measuring the high energy electromagnetic radiation and particles that they emit, including X rays, ultraviolet light, gamma rays. These observations are supplemented with computer simulations. The most energetic astrophysical uh, sources in the Milky Way, cosmic accelerators capable of producing high energy cosmic rays, have resisted discovery for over a century. Up to now, astrophysicists sought these sources mainly by scouring the galaxy for the gamma rays they are expected to admit to, to emit, emit. June 30th of 2023, the Ice Cube uh, Observatory uh, discovered the first high energy instruments from the Milky Way, inaugurating a telltale stream of evidence, cosmic ray production, and, inter and interaction in the galaxy. The study was published in December. Uh, neutrinos were discovered in the form of diffuse flux from the galaxy plane whose spe spatial distribution matches that of previously detected gamma rays from the Milky Way. The flux of high-energy neutrinos from the galactic plane contains 
six to 13 percent of all the high uh, all sky high energy neutrino flux were uh, first discovered by ice cube in 2013. we've all seen photos of our milky way like we said and uh and that's the story on that. So we have another way of looking at the universe. Did it. Okay. Radio observations of the young star H.L. Tori revealed a massive protoplanetary disk of dust and gas surrounding the star uh, at the center. Uh, nascent planets are uh, can affect the material orbiting in the disk, causing instabilities and carving out gaps. Researchers are now using... Uh, artificial intelligence to help identify subtle signs of planet formation within such disks. Um, uh, headlines in 2023 were often uh, dominated by the way uh, uh, artificial intelligence is changing our world. And although the use of machine learning tools in astronomy isn't new, the practice began to see more attention in 2023. Um, in uh, January the 30th, 2023, paper in uh, Nature Astronomy showed how scientists searching for alien civilizations uses AI to sift through nearly 500 hours of radio signals, so signals from over 800 stars. They were looking for patterns that couldn't be natural while throwing out interference from human technology. The algorithm pared down nearly 3 million events in the past um uh, in the past, uh, uh, which were examined by I, and to ultimately uh, identify eight possible techno signatures, signs of technologically advanced civilizations from five stars. The signals were not seen when these stars were reobserved, so we haven't found aliens yet. But the researchers noted that the technique had fulfilled its purpose by identifying specific signals for follow up. Uh, an April the 21st paper in the Astrophysical Journal showed that machine learning tools can identify planets forming in the disk of dust and gas around a star. A team led by Jason Terry of the University of Georgia in Athens developed an algorithm to search images for the social signs of fledging planets, which affect the orbit um, of nearby material and eventually carve out gaps in the disk. Not only did their model rediscover known planets, it also flagged a planet around the star HD 142666 that researchers hadn't spotted. Terry's team followed up and confirmed a likely forming planet there, demonstrating the model's potential. We think that with it, we think there will be an important place for these types of techniques as our star, as our data sets get even larger. Terry said in a press release on Feb September the 25th, he wrote a paper in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences presented a machine learning algorithm that could determine whether a sample material was produced by life or through natural uh, abiotic processes. And it could do so with 90% accuracy. The technology can be used on future space missions or trace the history of the ancient life on Earth. These are just highlights from a year filled with AI-assisted discoveries. There will doubtless be many more in the years to come. H.L. Torrey being studied for the first time using artificial intelligence to identify signs of planetary formation within the disks. ALMA image, the photoplanetary disk, in the HL Terrace, this is the sharpest image ever taken by Alma, sharper than is routinely seen visible life with the NASA Cubble telescope. Uh, it shows that protoplanetary disks surrounding the young star HL Tori. These are Alma observations reveal substructures within the disk that have never been seen before. They even show the possible positions of planets forming in the dark patches. And that kind of gives that an idea of that particular finding this year. Now we have heavy, highly magnetic star, maybe the first magnetar precursor ever seen. This is getting this is kind of tough stuff now because we're really starting to get into other ways of doing this, and this is important. This is on August of 2023. 
heavy light, a highly magnetic star, uh, a heavy uh, highly magnetic star may be first first magnet star, uh, magnetar rather precursor we've seen. A strange history has produced a helium rich star with kilogauss magnetic fields. Magnetars and other strangeness, uh, the true identity of a star that has baffled astronomers for more than 100 years has finally come to light. Now a team led by uh, astronomer Tomer Schienar of the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands has discovered that this particular peculiar beast has one incredibly powerful magnetic field, suggesting that when it finally pops, its star clogs it will it clogs it will transform into something known as a magnetar. The detection makes HD forty five one sixty six the first known magnetic Wolf Rayet star, and it solves the problems previously associated with the binary and fills in some of the gaps in our knowledge about how massive stars turn into the most magnetic objects in the universe. HD forty forty five one sixty six is a dying wolf riot star around 3,000 light years away. Like most stars in its class, it's rich in helium and has a companion. Previous measures, measurements of the binary had found the wolf riot star was rich in helium around four times the mass of the sun and on a tight 1.6 day orbit with a B type star. These properties, however, are at odds with what we know about the evolution of binaries and how stellar winds uh, are launched. The spectral information that caused us to revise what the star looks like also provided information on its magnetic field. Magnetic fields influence the polarization of light and the researchers obtained the polarization using light emitted by the number of ions that were trapped within the root wolf ray at star's magnetic field. This data was used to provide an estimate of the strength of the magnetic field, which turns out to be in the area of 40,000 Gauss. For comparison, the Earth's magnetic field is less than a Gauss. While the star is a relatively is relatively light at, at twice the sun's mass, that's still large enough to end in a supernova that leaves behind a neutron star. That neutron star should have the radius in the order of a dozen kilometers uh, or kilometers, as some people like to say. If you conserve the 40,000 Gauss magnetic field at the surface of the star, but crush it down to the new 12 kilometer radius surface, then you end up with a magnetic field strength of about 1,014 Gauss, meaning you have a magnetar. Um, so the Rule for Riot star is a magnetar precursor, the first we've ever seen. HD 45166 has a magnetic field strength of 43,000 Gauss. That's the most powerful magnetic field ever recorded in a massive star. Secondly, the star is way less massive than we thought, only around two times, like we said, the mass of the sun. But it is also unlike any other Wolf Riot star Seen so the research uh, team dug into its history through simulations. These suggest that the normal companion star is simply too far away to have a major influence on the system's evolution. Instead, it's likely that the HD 45166 started out as a three star system, with the Wolf Riot star having originally been two stars orbiting each other at a short distance. Their interactions led to the period where two, their two helium-rich cores shared a single hydrogen-rich envelope. The two cores spiraled inward and merged, ejecting the hydrogen in the process. Uh, what remained was a small helium-rich star with an intense magnetic field. That magnetic field trapped some of the material that might otherwise be ejected, producing the spectral lines that helped the researchers figure out what's going on. That's pretty a pretty distinct set of circumstances, which might suggest these precursors are rare, but it's estimated that as many as 10% of the neutron stars go through a magnetar phase, which should mean they're reason, reasonably common. How do we explain this discrepancy? Researchers suggest that we may already have observed some similar stars. The only reason we were able to figure this system out 
is the presence of the companion star. And that's not common for Wolf Rea stars. So it should be that we've already observed similar stars and haven't been able to recognize them. That's my probably my grandson. He never gets it. Okay, moving on. Okay, uh, we had a hybrid solar eclipse occur on Thursday, April the 20th, 2023. There's the path. Uh, my friend uh, Fred Aspenak went uh, to the um, east uh, west coast of Australia, and it was just a momentary eclipse, and you can see how the shadow goes across, and there's a picture of it when it hit totality. Like I said, it was only a few seconds long. Um, uh, did it again, didn't it? Got to go back. The mouse. the mouse. Tell me. That's what I want. Okay. On April the 20th, 2023, the hybrid solar eclipse occurred. Um, it was a Thursday. Uh, the solar eclipse occurred when the moon phases between the Earth and the sun, thereby totally or partially or partly obscuring the sun for a view on Earth. A hybrid solar eclipse is a rare type of solar eclipse that changes its appearance from annular to total and back as the moon's shadow moves across the Earth's surface. Uh, totality occurs in a narrow bath across the surface of the Earth with the partial solar eclipse visible over the surrounding region, thousands of kilometers wide. Hybrid solar eclipses are extremely rare, occurring in only 3.1% of total solar eclipses in the 21st century. Totality for this eclipse was visible in Northwest Cape Peninsula in Barrow Island, Western Australia, Eastern parts of, of uh, East Timor, as well as Dar Damar Island and parts of the province of Papua in Indonesia. More than 20,000 people watched the eclipse from the town of Exmouth in Western Australia's Northwest Cape, providing infrastructure and services for the visitors uh, across the state government in Western Australia about twenty million dollars. Uh, the uh, the date marked a significant moment in of auto tourism and tourism in Western Australia. Uh, portions of the eclipse path near sunrise and sunset were annular, with the eclipse occurring forty four point one days after perigee um, or perigee, if you like, April sixteenth. The moon's apparent diameter was one point zero two percent larger than average. And then we had an annular solar eclipse on October the 14th. Annular solar eclipse occurred. Uh, a, um, an annular eclipse is when the moon is too far away from the uh, Earth to cover the entire face of the moon. And by the way, if you see an annular eclipse, you always wear protection because every point on the surface of the sun is as bright as the whole sun. That's something to always remember. They're very cool to look at, but they are, they are dangerous. Uh, and it, um, the, uh, an annular solar eclipse occurs when the moon's apparent diameter is smaller than the sun's, blocking most of the sun's light and causing the sun to look like an annulus. That is a ring, by the way, the word. An annular eclipse appears as a partial eclipse over a region of the Earth thousands of kilometers or miles wide, uh, occurring uh, only 4.6 days after apogee. Um, the apogee this time was October the 10th, 2023. The moon's apparent diameter was small. The path of the eclipse crossed the United States beginning in Oregon, entering the Dune City, passing over Newport Crater Lake National Park, Eugene and Medford. After passing over the northeast corner of California, uh, it traveled through Nevada um, and, uh, and into Utah, passing over the Canyonlands National Park. Uh, after that, it covered the northeast corner of Arizona um, and uh, the southwest corner of Colorado. And then in, in, in New Mexico, it passed over Farmington, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Roswell, Hobbs, and Carlsbad. Uh, afterwards, it entered Texas, passing over Midland, Odessa, San Angelo, Pernville, San Antonio, and Corpus Christi before entering the Gulf of Mexico. This was the second annual uh, eclipse visible from Albuquerque in 11 years and where it crossed the path of uh, of the May 2012 eclipse. It also coincided with the last day 
the Albuquerque International Balloon Fest Fiesta. Has anybody ever seen that? Well, that's a very, very cool thing. They have all these um, balloons going around. It was so cool. And with the annual eclipse going on, it just kind of enhanced the whole thing, as I understand from my friends who were there. Okay, uh, 291 exoplanets were discovered in 2023. I'm on that name of them all. One of the week's new uh, six new planets is MWC 758C, uh, a directly imaged giant planet forming spiral arms around its very young star, which still has a, its photoplanetary disk. The other planets are HD. Well, we don't have to name them. There's four other ones that were major at that point in time. Um, there was also one uh, called uh, HD 35850, is an, an F-type main sequence star located 87.5 light years uh, away from the solar system in the constellation of Libus with an apparent magnitude of 6.3. It is positive 6.3. It is near the limit of naked eye visibility under ideal conditions, while some studies consider it to be uh, a close spectroscopic binary with a separation of 0.021 astronomical units. Uh, an astronomical unit is obviously the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Uh, other studies show new evidence of bin binarity, um, and it is likely to be that the supposed binarity is an artifact resulting from the presence of star spots. HD 161942 is a single herbid uh, AEBE star. Its surface temperature is about 70, uh, 650 um, uh, uh, Kelvin. Uh, HG is depleted of heavy elements compared to the sun with a metallicity um, much less, which is, a, is much younger at the age of 7.5 million years, plus or minus 4.5. Star is rotating slowly and has relatively low stellar activity for an herbig H A B B E star. Uh, HP 99770B is a directly imaged super Jovian extrasolar sol solar planet orbiting the dusty A star HB 99770, uh, detected with the Gaius Hipparchus precision astronomy and high contrast imaging, uh, excuse me, and high uh, contrast imaging HP 9977 is the first joint direct imaging astronomic discovery of an extrasolar planet and the first planet discovered using precision astrometry, uh, astro astrometry uh, from the Gaia mission. And then we had a couple of successful landers and a couple of not so sexers. The moon was the hottest ticket in town with the landing attempts in 2023 by Russia, India, and the private Japanese company. Only India prevailed, becoming the fourth country to do so. Two U.S. companies, uh, China and the Japanese Space Agency, are targeting touchdowns, some as, as early as January. Another crew will actually land, but the time is yet uncertain. And then we had a rocket debut, the biggest and most powerful rocket ever built. The SpaceX Starship launched uh, twice from South Texas in 2023, and both times blew up and littered the Gulf of Mexico. Second test flight lasted twice as long and soared 80, 93 miles. Uh, SpaceX wants to empty the empty spacecraft to make it around the world before adding satellites and people. Good idea. And NASA's next moonwalkers will uh, need a Starship to get uh, to the lunar surface. Three other rockets are set to make their debut in 2024. United to launch Alliance Vulcan and then a lunar lander, Blue Array, uh, Array uh, Origins New Clan, the um, company's first orbital class rocket and Europe's upgraded Arleon 6 rocket. And then we had a couple of spacecrafts. We had the Sykes spacecraft and the Lucy spacecraft. And they're billed as an asteroid uh, autumn in September, Osiris Rex, a spacecraft which you know about, delivered the payload from Benno. A couple of weeks later, the Psyche, Psyche a spacecraft, blasted off on a six year cruise to a metal rich asteroid bearing the same name. Then in November, the Lucy spacecraft zoomed past the first asteroid on its crowded itinerary, discovering 
a mini moon with two fused orbs. Uh, lab workers in Houston are still trying to pry open the asteroid sample canister that landed in the Utah desert. So far, scientists have removed 2.5 ounces of Bennu's black dust and chips of rock. And the last story that I have is the first moon crew in 50 years includes a woman and a black astronaut. Uh, NASA clicked off it kicked off 2023 by introducing four astronauts who were slated to fly around the moon in late 2024, three from the U.S. and, and a Canadian. The mission's first moon crew in 50 years includes uh, a woman, black astronaut. Reed Wiseman will be joined by Victor Glover, an African-American naval adviver, a, a, aviator. Uh, Christina Koch holds the world record for the longest space drive by a, a woman. And the Canadian's Jeremy Hansen a former pilot, and the crew's lone space rookie. A Wiseman, Glover, and Koch have all lived on the International Space Station, all four are in their 40s. And that is the story of uh, some of the, the things. Okay, part two. The main topics I'm going to talk about are James Webb Space Telescope discoveries. I'm going to focus on one in some detail. I'll then more briefly talk about uh, discoveries on Mars then the Breakthrough Listen project, and finally, Venus. So the Webb Telescope is really, you can see this, right? Ah, I don't see the cursor. Is there a way to get the cursor visible? You won't see it on the screen. Okay, can the people who are remote see it? Okay, all right, thank you. Sorry, I can't uh, point with anything that you guys could see. Um, if somebody has a laser pointer I could borrow, I could at least use it for the audience here. Um, so as you can see from the diagram, things that are we doing? Oh, I got a cursor, Bob. Bob, I got I got something. So, so here's the limit of how far back the Hubble telescope can see, roughly seeing some of the first galaxies forming, but the web can see essentially all of them, or most of them, as far as we know. Um, back beyond star formation, uh, beyond galaxy formation, potentially maybe we'll see some of the earliest stars forming. Exceptionally, some galaxies were seen only 300 million years after the Big Bang. This was to say the least, not expected, at least to see significant size galaxies. Uh, studies, models of galaxy formation in, indicate that you need billions of years to form a galaxy like the Milky Way, that kind of mass and size. But here we were seeing galaxies that were only 300, existed 300 million years or 0.3 billion years after the Big Bang that were as big as the Milky Way, uh, some were even bigger, or so it appeared. This led to pandemonium. Uh, this is a small sample of some of the headlines that have appeared. Ancient universe breaker galaxies discovered, say baffled scientists, or 
huge galaxies appear to be far larger than is possible so early after the Big Bang, say scientists, or simply Big Bang is wrong. Uh, this is high magnification views of a uh, sample of these very ancient galaxies. Notice you can't see really any detail on them. They're so far away. But nonetheless, there they are. And something is wrong. Something is wrong. For example, Professor Rajendra Gupta of the University of Ottawa calculated that the universe was, in fact, 26.7 billion years old, much almost twice as old as the standard Big Bang theory would imply. Uh, to get this number, he had his own model, which merged together uh, a combination of the usual expansion of the universe, a la Hubble theory, with an old theory by none other than Fritz Zwicky, uh, who lived, did his work almost a century ago. He had a tired light theory uh, for how light would get redshifted, not just from expansion of the universe, a la Hubble, but Zwicky's theory was uh, photons of light as they traversed huge distances across the galaxy, across the universe, would suffer collisions and lose energy little by little. And when a photon loses energy, that means it has a longer wavelength. So it's a different effect causing redshift. So his model again said the universe was twice as old, and it, being twice as old mature galaxies would have plenty of time to form if they're only about 13 and a half billion years, uh, years old. Others went even farther than that and imagined a cyclic universe where you have a big bang and then a big crunch and then a big bang and then a big crunch, cyclic going back and forth. And after every crunch in the new Big Bang, some galaxies would remain from the previous bang. And so it's easy to get very old, mature galaxies that seem to be young that way. Um, and stay tuned, discovery of even earlier galaxies, people say, is possible using gravitational lensing and the Webb telescope. Okay where you can use galaxies to focus light from even farther away and make it bright enough to detect. So the Gupta theory had some strengths, but also some problems. And it acknowledged that there were some things to be worked out with this theory. Uh, in particular, uh, his study clashed with studies of the ages of the oldest stars which didn't go back far enough uh, to his uh, 26.7 billion years. And also with, he had problems with the cosmic microwave background and other things. So he acknowledged that there were some problems, but this was his theory. And, you know, there's a whole universe of YouTube videos that follows this stuff with people who are not actual astronomers themselves, but are kind of wannabe astronomers who put out, you know, they'll quote some things from scientific studies and then go way off the deep end with their own uh, story about what those discoveries mean. Um, all of this, I think, has, has now found a much simpler resolution with the studies of Alex Cameron and others at Oxford University. Finally, the Webb Telescope has been used to do detailed spectroscopic studies of these very distant, very early galaxies. And these kind of, that kind of study had not yet been done for lack of telescope time. With that, new data, it shows that the distribution of stars in early galaxies was different 
from that of the Milky Way galaxy and other nearby galaxies. What does that mean? It turns out that when astronomers heretofore have studied early galaxies, they always assumed that the distribution of star masses in very distant galaxies was the same as the distribution of star masses in our galaxy and other nearby galaxies. Cameron found something different. He said very massive stars were unusually abundant in the early universe. This turns out to be a very big deal. Let me try to explain it using this simple diagram, which I must confess, and I have a reference down here, by the way. Dr. Becky Smethurst uh, of Cambridge. I can't remember if she's at Cambridge or Oxford. Anyhow, she's an astrophysicist, uh, had a video about this. And I pulled this off of her video. Imagine this is a galaxy of stars and this is a galaxy of stars. This galaxy of stars has many sun-like stars in them, a whole lot of them, like our galaxy. Our galaxy, I know, has a distribution of star sizes, but I'm simplifying the story to make it understandable. So here's our galaxy with many, let's say, sun-like stars, lots and lots of them putting out a certain amount of light altogether. Another galaxy, a very early ga galaxy in our universe, has only a few stars in it, but they are much more massive, like maybe as much as 100 times more massive each star as the stars in our galaxy. Stars that are 100 times more massive are incredibly luminous luminosities that are 100,000 times greater than the luminosity of our suns. So a small number of these very massive stars would put out as much brightness or light as a galaxy of sun-like stars would. So they're equal in brightness. However, the mass is very different. These smaller stars, because there are so many of them, would have a much higher mass than these massive stars because there are so few of them. Does that start to give you the understanding of how this thing is going to, excuse me, is going to be resolved? Cameron is saying, according to his spectroscopic data, the early galaxies in our universe were more like this equal luminosity to the assumed uh, distribution of stars, but much less mass. If you're into graphs, here's some actual data. The Gupta model, for example, assumed that the distribution of star masses, this is the probability of the mass being at any given value of a star to here, there's a graph of the actual masses of individual stars. This is what that distribution looks like for our galaxy. Cameron's data shows that these very dis distant, very early galaxies have many much higher uh, uh, number of massive stars. So the higher mass stars in early galaxies cause them to give off more light, making the mass of a galaxy appear to be anomalously large based on the total amount of light given off. We didn't measure the mass of a galaxy, we measured how much light they gave off. This new finding reduces the calculated masses of these early ga galaxies by a factor of 20, which fixes the problem, okay? Once you know that the, there are many more very massive stars in these distant galaxies, no need to, to think that the universe is older than 13.8 billion years. 
why would these early galaxies have, have had so many massive stars, you might ask? These high-mass high stars were produced because the early universe was very dense. What does that mean? That means the universe used to be a lot smaller. It's expanding, right? If you go back in time to the very early universe, it was much smaller, so the mass in it was very, very dense. And so when a star started to form, there's a huge amount of material near the star that could be sucked in gravitationally and form a very massive star. Sort of makes sense. So many previous studies of the early universe, not just the ones based on this Webb telescope data, but studies, for example, based on Hub Hub uh, the Hubble Space Telescope data, were wrong because they used the wrong distribution of stars in those galaxies. So a huge amount of work is going to have to be done by astronomers to redo a lot of those studies uh, and re-examine whatever conclusions they drew from those studies. So if we assume that the Cameron data holds up to further investigation and study, which we will see soon, within the year, I'm sure, we assume that his data holds up, then the problem of the age of the universe goes away. And the universe is still 13.8 billion years old. Stay tuned. This is a hot, hot topic. I'd say it's, in some sense, at least from the point of view of the structure of the universe, it's by far the biggest thing going on in astronomy right now. Second topic, Mars. The best equipped, newest rover on Mars is a NASA rover called Perseverance. I think pretty much everybody here knows that. And it recently passed its 1,000th day on Mars. Uh, it was sent to this crater here, which is roughly 50 kilometers in, in diameter, called Jezero Crater. Um, this crater is strongly believed to have been filled with water billions of years ago, early in the history of Mars, fed by a river that comes up this way. It's hard to see in this picture, but there's the, a, a dry riverbed that came down here, formed a delta. Maybe you can see that here, a, ri a river delta. So the rover was put down here on the bottom of the crater or lake did some studies there, and then started working its way through the delta, up through, and now is working on this riverbed. Oops. Here's a 10 times enlarged view. You can see here where the rover landed and did some initial studies of uh, the lake bed here, and then came around this way and has been uh, by the way, these red symbols show where a soil sample was drilled out and analyzed and stored. Um, so then the rover went up through this river delta region, and now it's here. Uh, the helicopter that's with it is a little farther ahead of it, doing survey work. And the rover will be coming up this dry riverbed in the future. But there are conclusions already beginning to form. The conclusion so far is that the right ingredients for life were found, the right minerals, for example, just like the earlier Curiosity rover found studying a different site on Mars, but no significant evidence of past or present life has been found. No significant evidence of life. Now, if a sample return mission happens in the future, and it'll be several years before it does, if the money turns up for it, then 
some of these samples that are being collected will be brought back to the earth for much more intensive study with much better instruments than is, are present on the Perseverance rover. So there's a possibility that there will be found evidence, say for ancient long dead life or something like that in these uh, drill core samples that have been taken. If the evidence today was a little more encouraging that there were hints of past life in the using the instruments on board the rover, I think it would greatly enhance the chances of the, that sample return mission getting fully funded. Stay tuned for that. Third topic, breakthrough listen. This is a well-funded, $100 million funded mission over, spread out over 10 years, starting eight years ago, to look for alien radio signals using huge radio telescopes like the one you see here, you know, basically renting time on those telescopes. Result, first they've studied a million stars in our galaxy they have not found any techno signatures, as they call it, which is radio signals that are structured in some way that would be indicative of intelligent life sending out signals. Most recently, they look for radio signals from 97 nearby galaxies. Guess what? No signals were found. Is that a surprise to anybody? If you do the math, you would have to take all the light and heat give, being given off by the sun, surround the sun with, completely surround the sun with solar cells, soak up all the energy being emitted by the light and put that into a radio transmitter, pointed point at us, that's what it would take to detect a radio signal from one of these distant galaxies. This is, I'm gonna call a spade a spade. I mean, okay, maybe it's not totally ridiculous, but it's mostly ridiculous, right? In fact, I gave a presentation right here a few years ago on looking for radio signals from stars and meaning planets going around stars in our own galaxy. And it turns out with the best equipment we have, you can't see signals from any, from any more distant than a few hundred light years. Most stars in the galaxy overwhelmingly are way farther away than a few hundred light years. The galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. So the probability if, if you say maybe there are 10,000 civilizations currently emitting radio signals and aiming them our way, the probability of one of them being within 300 light years is, is statistically zero. I'm not saying it's not worth looking. I'm glad somebody, a private person paid for this and we didn't have to. Uh, I mean, I won't say it's a mistake to do it, but the result was expected. Finally, um, Venus for quite a while has been thought to be dormant geologically uh, with little or no geological activity. Most of the surface of Venus is volcanic. Uh, NASA satellites have been doing radar imaging down through the clouds of Venus of the surface for quite a while now. And so they fly over the same region repeatedly and newly examined radar images show changes in the lava flow patterns on some of these volcanoes. That means it's volcanically active, okay? This is sort of a fairly, from a planetary physics point of view, this is kind of important. I'll end this with a few honorable mentions. 
A study says that a star familiar to most of us called Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse or whatever your favorite way of pronouncing it might be, could go supernova within the next few decades. This would be spectacular for us if it would happen because it's not that far away. Uh, secondly, a James Webb study of exoplanet K218b found rather weak evidence of a compound called dimethyl sulfide in the atmosphere of that planet. That's a chemical that is not made by any natural process. So it's a weird chemical that I never heard of, although I understand what that chemical would look like. But it would have, as far as our chemists say, it would have to be be made by a technically advanced civilization. Those who have examined that paper closely say they didn't, they're probably wrong, uh, but there's a possibility of that. You can bet that'll be examined in greater detail. Lastly, a new way to detect gravitational waves has been found and documented by pulsar timing arrays where you examine light coming from pulsars. I'm not going to go into that, what they are, but they're basically something like stars that are precision clocks, where the signals go beep, beep, beep with great precision. By studying these over the last 15 years, coming from many different directions, it's been determined that there are very long, slow gravitational waves coming our way, a likely source of these very low frequency, you know, 10 year timescale gravitational waves is two massive black holes that are orbiting each other very slowly because they're not very close to each other. So if they take 10 or 15 years to go around once, they would produce this sort of thing. With time, they'll get closer and closer and closer until they merge, then we'll get a big bleep. But this is a way of detecting gravitational waves that are way slower, way, way slower than our, our usual gravitational wave detectors. Slower by factor of, I don't know, something like a million. I didn't calculate it, but something like that. So there are a lot of discoveries, some types of discoveries like exoplanets, Maybe more interesting to, to some people than other things. Uh, but between the stuff Ken presented and what I presented, we at least gave you a cross section of some of the big discoveries of the past year. Thanks for your attention. Are there any questions? Right? Any questions for anybody? Yes. Yeah. Well, hydrocarbon compounds would be the obvious thing. Uh, yeah, well, amino acids, sure. Um, but you might find traces of, you know, fragments of large organic molecules. The problem is most likely if they found, if they drilled out a sample that had evidence of ancient life, the organic molecules, if at least they were of any size, would have been ripped up to shreds by cosmic rays that can penetrate the six or so inches that this drill bit goes down. So we'd be looking for fragments of large organic molecules. And they haven't found that. The Curiosity rover wasn't didn't have as good of equipment to look for that kind of stuff. Uh, this ro the Perseverance rover did have some capability in that uh, regard. But if we can get those samples back to Earth, we have way way better instruments to look for that kind of thing. So I hope we get those samples back. We will see. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, th thanks. Uh, thanks to both of you. They're really uh, very good updates. Really great. So, uh, Dale, I have one quick question to you. So, you said that uh, you know, so 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 th so that private individual who who funded the 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 hundred million you know project to uh, basically uh, search for these radio signals, and you said that that, that the, the probability of getting really a signal is zero, and you gave some numbers for that. So, my question there is. Um, so I just want to know the reason for why you think so. Is it because you no, know, by the time these radio signals come from the galaxies, do they get absorbed by the material? You no, know, say for example by the stars or planets or something like that. Well, I just want, just want to ask you like what could be the reason that uh, we don't see any radio signals, Dale? Yeah. Thank okay, you. good question. Um, why do we not see? Why am I saying if there are civilizations transmitting in our direction from large distances, either from other galaxies or even large distances within our own galaxy, why can we not see those signals? Well, the signals get weaker as distance squared, right? Just like light, you know, the light of stars gets weaker by the distance squared that the light travels because it spreads out with distance. And uh, the farther it goes, the weaker the signals go get until they get well below the, the level of natural background radio noise, it's static, or it's called noise, even though it's not the kind of noise you can hear with your ear. It's like if you have an old fashioned radio, even new ones, if you uh, have an analog radio dial where you can turn it and you can hear lots of static where there's no strong uh, radio station. That's what you hear at all wavelengths, all frequencies of radio waves in, in our galaxy. Um, and so when sig if there were signals from a distant source, once it falls way below that background noise level, you can't see it, you can't hear it. And I've been in contact, I've literally, I mean, I've I've emailed two scientists who work for SETI uh, at the SETI Institute, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, um, asking them to confirm what I'm thinking that those signals become too weak to detect with our best equipment. And assuming, by the way, that somebody's aiming with a good-sized antenna those signals right at us, okay? Um, I got two very different answers. From those two scientists, astronomers, one of them who's the co-author of a textbook I'm teaching from, uh, where I teach astronomy at Macomb Community College, one of them blew me off and said, I'm just wrong. Gave, I mean, there was a response, okay? Gave no reasons. Um, the other one sent, sent me a very different response, a very, well, actually, I emailed, what is her name, Jill, uh, she's a very senior astronomer at the SETI Institute, Jill Tarter, I think her name is. I emailed her, and she, she referred me to one of her colleagues who's an expert in that, who is himself a radio astronomer. I can't remember his name at the moment, but he sent me the basic equations and illustrated for me how, how the, uh, what the minimum strength of a radio signal is that we could detect with our various radio telescopes. I went through the numbers he sent me in the equations. They all make sense to me. I, I understand them. And, and he, he agrees that uh, our sensitivity uh, is on the order of roughly 300 light years. Um, now, if you boost the signal, you can detect signals farther away, but again, they're going to fall off with one over R squared, right? So for a pragmatic limit, he suggests uh, a radio signal strength which would imply a detection distance of about 300 light years, give or take some, maybe 400 light years. Um, and he was actually complaining. I mean, there's a whole nother, am I taking too long? Okay, he was complaining about some of his colleagues 
that have been looking for laser signals rather than radio signals, okay? And what he's complaining about, some of them claim that they can detect signals from across our galaxy and perhaps even from other galaxies. And, and I found a paper from those people saying they studied, I think, 5,000 some promising stars in our galaxy and looked at a few other galaxies. And they, their result was they don't find any signals. But he's saying they're assuming a huge intensity of laser beams pointed in our direction, just unrealistically huge to, to suggest that they would stand any chance whatever of detecting signals from the far side of our galaxy and especially from other galaxies. So I felt like I was talking to a real person there who has real expertise. Um, and he was saying, the limit is not very distant. And by the way, I frequently hear people who talk about this say, man, we're broadcasting signals like crazy for over a hundred years now. You know, we've got these powerful uh, radio stations, AM and FM and all of that stuff. That stuff is undetectable even one light year away because by design, those radio signals send out signals in all directions. So the amount going in any specific direction toward another star is very small, okay? The, the strongest signals that we routinely send out from the point of view of detecting them a long distance away are high-powered military radars because they're extremely focused and quite high power. Even so, those signals uh probably not even 300 light years detection range okay you need a huge radio disc like the, the arecibo disc or the new fast radio telescope in china to stand uh, to, to be able to get even 300 maybe at most 400 light years detection range okay yeah i know the arecibo is gone um so i mean that's that's why I don't want to put down people who are looking for signals. That's that's a good thing, right? Because maybe there's something we don't know. Uh, always be prepared. Be prepared to be surprised, right, by what you might find. Uh, I'm glad the study's getting done, but I'm not surprised that they're not finding anything. <laughs> Okay, let me, Ken Burton has been making some comments, and I'm sorry that our uh, YouTube audience can't hear them. Ken, in essence, is saying, and I'm going to summarize it quickly, that in his view, uh, life is widespread in the universe, um, and he he's commenting on what I've said to say, if, if there is intelligent life out there sending signals around just like we are, we can't detect it. it. Our lack of detection does not mean it's not there. We're blind to any signals they might be sending um, unless they're right on top of us, so to speak, right. within a few hundred light years. Um, I'm 
not disagreeing with Ken. Um, I have a little more show me attitude about whether there is life out there. Uh, I'm not against it, but show me. Uh, the reason I put it that way, it would be a little different if we understood the mechanism by which life formed here on Earth. We don't. The mechanisms of evolution, I'm not a, a biology person, but the mechanisms of evolution are getting to be fairly well understood. So once you've got a simple one-celled life form, given lots of time, I get it how more and more complex life forms can be formed. Okay. The problem is, what is the probability that that first life form uh, spontaneously forms? We don't understand how it forms, so we can't calculate it. Okay. Um, and you might think, well, the simplest life form evolved from non living minerals. Well, you can say that, but the, the increase in complexity all in one step is astronomical, okay? Uh, whereas once you've got something living, you can make these little tiny one at a time changes over a long period of time, and that's how evolution does its thing. But you need, the, the model doesn't seem to work in terms of getting to that first living thing. So since we don't understand how that happened, we can't calculate its probability of happening. Therefore, I inject, at least into my own mind, uncertainty over how uh, pervasive life is in the universe. I, th I personally think, I, you know, I, I think we're using the wrong tool, frankly, to use radio telescopes and, and uh, spectroscopic studies looking for laser signals. I think that the much more better technique for looking for life is to examine biosignatures of planetary atmospheres. Um, and that's what we're gonna do with the Webb telescope and with these other gigantic telescopes that we built, the 30 meter telescope, you know, these three big telescopes that are being made. Um, now, if we find evidence of life in some planetary atmosphere, that by no means means that there's intelligent life there. Look at the history of life on this planet. Primitive life has, was around for billions of years before we even got two-celled organisms, right? Took a long time. And intelligent life has only been, you know, Homo sapiens have only, has only been around for something like 300,000 years. And we, if we assume the Neanderthals had some intelligence, maybe close to almost a million years, but a million years is a really small time scale compared to the time that life, primitive life has been here. So if we find a biosignature on a planet, chances that there's intelligent life there are minuscule, but it's possible at least. So those are some general comments. I gave a, a short presentation here a few months ago showing that interstellar travel for people is essentially impossible, okay? And I'm gonna say something weird here, all right? I really have to tell you this. I'm giving a presentation, I forget which Saturday evening it is at the Seven Ponds Nature Center on searching for extraterrestrial life. And I'm gonna say something that I find embarrassing when I give that presentation. 
and I don't think they're going to broadcast it. <laughs> um, I'm going to suggest that since interplanetary travel by physical beings like us is nearly impossible, I'm going to say that I have recently listened to some testimonies on YouTube by people who say they've been visited by aliens several times. And a lot of people have come and seen this stuff down south somewhere. Um, I found what they had to say rather compelling. I'm just being honest with you. And from the way they describe these beings that they saw, I don't think they're physical beings. I don't see how they could be if they came from other star systems. You, you can't travel the systems. So I, I'm, I'm starting to think that we do have visitors from other places, but they're not physical beings. You can call them whatever you want. I would tend to call them spiritual beings. But now you know I'm weird. Some of you always thought so. Okay. Yeah. If if you're interested, send me an email and I'll send you a link to the thing I found most compelling. Judge for yourself. Um uh, I was amazed. Um, it's a three-hour thing, and the guy even said, now uh, some people are going to make, make a movie about uh, their experiences. A lot of people have come and seen the stuff that they're seeing, including some people from NASA. Um, nobody wants to talk about it too much because it's embarrassing. <laughs> okay? Um, so I decided I'd be real with you. You can throw rotten eggs and all of that. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thanks for listening. Thank I have to throw in brother guy's comment about life in outer space. He says, if it has happened, it can happen. And well, here we are. So uh, our next meeting will be uh, next week, Thursday, January 18th at Macomb Community College. I will be in Tucson. Uh, our next open house is Saturday the 27th. And after this meeting, some of us will meet at the Redcoat Tavern, uh, Woodward, north of 13 Mile. And with that, uh, the, the meeting is over. Good night, everyone. Clear skies. <laughs>